Okay, we are going to, uh, <clears throat> we're going to have another sermon today about some things that need to be said, and um, uh, this one's a little different, but I think there's some things that need to be said. Um, the title of the sermon today is One Weird Heard, and I really think that's what the Open Door Church is. Just look around. <laughs> One Weird Heard. We're, we're going to talk about Titus chapter 2, um, the last part of verse 13 and then verse 14 out of the out of the King James version actually it's a new King James version it says our Savior Jesus Christ gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself here it is a peculiar people zealous of good works Often when I stand on this platform and I look out at this crowd, I think a peculiar people. But then when I see everything that this church accomplishes, I think zealous of good works. Do you get that? That's what, that's what Paul thought the church of his day looked like. A peculiar people, different, unusual, not in the norm as far as the world is concerned, and that's what the church is. Now, in, a, in, a, in an animated movie called Ice Age, any of you ever see Ice Age when it came out? Miss Jenny and I were in the Philippines when Ice Age came out, and we saw it over there. And, and, and so this, this animated movie, Ice Age, uh, when a saber-toothed tiber, tiger attacked a tribe of nomads, a mother and her baby attempt to outrun the man-eating beast, but are cornered at a raging waterfall. The little boy is discovered by a woolly mammoth named Manny and a sloth named Sid. You guys know what a sloth is? It's the laziest animal God ever created. And you know what God compares some of us to in the Proverbs? A sloth. And it's not a good thing. That's not a compliment. And so, anyway, Manny finds the baby and, and, and this, this sloth named Sid and a saber-toothed tiger named Dago. And these three unlikely companions unite on a common mission to return the baby to his father. And as the trio treks through a mountainous terrain of ice and snow carrying this baby, at one point the mammoth, the sloth, and the tiger realize they're on an erupting volcano. Did your life ever feel like that? And the heat of the lava melts the glacier ice bridges, separating Dago from the others. And here's what happens. Watch this clip. Come on, say something. Anything. <laughs> what? What? I can't hear you. You're standing on my trunk. Oh. <gasps> oh, you're okay. Oh, you're okay. Why did you do that? You could have died trying to save me. That's what you do in a herd. You look out for each other. Well, thanks. I don't know about you guys, but... We are the weirdest herd I've ever seen. <laughs> Is that the Open Door Church or what? We are the weirdest herd I have ever, ever seen. One weird herd. What a great description of the church, especially our church. No wonder the Apostle Paul wrote what he did to his young disciple Titus when he wrote, Our Savior, Jesus Christ, gave himself for us that he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people of good works. You see, that's what the church is. We are a peculiar people. We are different. 
or as Sid put it, we are one weird herd. And so today, I want to talk to you about three characteristics of this weird herd. Three things that the church needs to be in order for it to be that one weird herd that God has called us to be. You see, that, that, that storyline of the Ice Age is, is of unlikely companions on a common mission who look after each other. They look out for each other. And the story of Jesus' church is one of unlikely companions. Look around the room. Unlikely companions on a common mission who look after each other. So let's talk about what these three characteristics of this weird yet successful herd that Jesus called his church should be. The first one is unlikely companions. The second one is that we have a common mission and the third one is that we look out for each other. We just look after each other. So let's talk about the first one. Unlikely companions. We are a mix of people with different personalities, different backgrounds, different gift sets who might seem very unlikely to ever hang out together. I mean, if it weren't for the fact that, that we have this one thing in common, chances are many of us would never hang out together. We would never be in relationship together. And that one thing that draws us together as unlikely as it might seem for us to be companions is the love of Jesus. I think we all share that in common, don't you? The love of Jesus. And so incredible differences and variety among the followers of Jesus is at least in part what Paul was talking about when he wrote this in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse number 12, and then down in verse number 14. He wrote, the human body has many parts, but the many parts make up one whole body. So it is with the body of Christ. Yes, the body has many different parts, not just one part. Do you get that? Many different parts, not just one part. And it is crucial that in the herd, we understand that. In the herd, we got to understand that we're not all just alike. God didn't intend for us all to be just alike. We don't all think alike. We don't all reason the same way. We don't all dress alike. We don't all have the same hairstyles. We don't all have the same interests or activities or hobbies or our, our style of family life. We're all incredibly different. And God intended for it to be that way from the very beginning. I have been in lots of churches. And when I find myself in a church where everybody is based alike I think to myself this church is dying do you know why because if everybody in the church is basically alike and somebody else comes in they're gonna feel terribly out of place aren't they but if you look around this room in this church, you will find that there is such an incredible variety of people here that we are all so different so unique so weird even though we hang out together on Sundays and at other times when we're doing ministry together, almost anybody can come into this church and find somebody they can relate to. Isn't that true? And so that's why, that's why we tend to attract such a, such a wide variety of people, and I think God intended for it to be that way from the very beginning. You see, from the beginning, Jesus designed his church to be this weird herd. I want you to think about the first few disciples that he called to follow him. I think God had a sense of humor when he did this. Um, here, here it is. The first four were two pairs of brother, who, brothers who were commercial fishermen. Peter and Andrew and James and John. Two pairs of brothers, commercial fishermen. It, Matthew wrote this in, in Matthew chapter 4, verses 18 and 19. As Jesus was walking uh, beside the Sea of Galilee, he saw two brothers, Simon called Peter and his brother Andrew. They were casting a net into the lake, for they were fishermen. Come and follow me, Jesus said. And then the story goes on that they just dropped everything and went and followed him. Two upstanding, respectable businessmen left their business of commercial fishing and went to follow Jesus. And so Jesus walked a little further down the beach, and this scene occurred. It's recorded in verses 21 and 22 of Matthew chapter 4. Going on from there, he saw two other brothers, James, the son of Zebedee, and his brother John. 
They were in a boat with their father Zebedee preparing their nets. Jesus called them and immediately they left the boat and their father and followed him. So the first four members of this new church movement that is soon to sweep over Palestine are four men who are basically the same, right? Four men who are basically the same, from the same Jewish background, from the same hometown, in the same occupation. They're all commercial fishermen, and you'd say, wow, you know, there's some uniformity there. They got things together. They're going to understand each other there, and you're going to say, that's a a really, really good thing. But then the next thing Jesus does will just throw a curveball at you. The next man Jesus called to join the herd was, of all things, a tax collector. The tax collectors were notoriously hated by everybody else because all their countrymen, all these other Jews, viewed them as traitors. They had sold out. They were working for the enemy. The Romans had conquered the Jews and were, were laying heavy taxes on them to support the Roman government and the Roman army that was then used to keep these people in subjection. And from their point of view, they had robbed them of their dignity and their independence and their government and everything about their life had radically changed when they were conquered by the Romans. And now these tax collectors were Jewish people who had sold out to the Romans and were working for the Roman government and were collecting taxes from them. And not only were they collecting taxes, taxes that were going to support the enemy, but the, the Roman system of, of supporting their tax collectors was this. The tax collector was required to collect a certain amount of taxes from the people and send it to Rome, and then anything he could collect above that was his to keep. And so these tax collectors jacked the taxes up way high and became exorbitantly rich at the expense of their fellow countrymen. And so it was a a, a deal where not only were they viewed as traitors, but they were viewed as thieves. And so nobody, no self-respecting Jew would have anything to do with a tax collector. And so since tax collectors had trouble finding any friends among the self-respecting crowd, guess who their only friends were? other tax collectors, and the prostitutes. That's why the tax collectors and the harlots or the prostitutes, they they were always hanging out together. Nobody else would hang out with either one of them. And so they kind of fit together. And then it just really messed up the minds of the established religious crowd when Jesus went into the home of a tax collector and invited the prostitutes in and had dinner with them. And they got to know him on a personal level. And many of them received the gift of eternal life. And because they received the gift of eternal life, Jesus looked at the religious crowd who didn't believe in him and had not received that gift. And he said, the publicans, the tax collectors, the prostitutes are going to get into the kingdom of heaven ahead of you. Do you get that? Now think about that. Think about that for, for just a minute. He called this tax collector. Matthew wrote about it. Excuse me. Mark wrote about it. In Mark chapter 2, verses 13 and 14, once again, Jesus went out beside the lake. Now, that's important that you get that. He went out beside the lake. And a large crowd came to him, and he began to teach them. And as he walked along, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus. This guy is also called Matthew in the scriptures, the one who wrote Matthew's gospel, one of the twelve. His given name was Matthew. His family name was Levi. And his daddy's name was Alphaeus. Alphaeus Levi had a little boy named Matthew. And so he was Matthew or Levi, the son of Alphaeus. And he was sitting at his tax collector's booth. Now stop and think about the geography here with me. Where are they when this happens? On the shore of the lake. He's walking along the shore of the lake. And what do they come to along the shore of the lake? A tax collector's booth. Who do you think this tax collector has been collecting taxes from since his tax collecting booth was on the, on the lake shore? The fishermen. He is the guy who has been collecting exorbitant taxes from these fishermen, these first four guys that Jesus said, come and join the herd. Then he comes to another guy that these guys would naturally hate and despise and not want to have anything to do with and have all kinds of bad feelings toward him. And Jesus has the gall to call a tax collector to be part of the group. You know why he did that? Because he really did want one weird herd that everybody could find somebody that they could relate to in the herd. And you know the real call on the first four is tough. 
Oh, Matthew was excited to be called because nobody had ever invited him to anything before unless it was another tax collector or a prostitute. And suddenly, a self-respecting rabbi has invited him to be one of his disciples. Matthew's excited. He got up and left the tax collector's booth and went to follow Jesus. So now we really do have a weird herd here, and there's only five of them with Jesus as their leader. And so he does that. He, 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 sees, he sees Matthew sitting there at the tax collector's booth, and, and, and he says to him, follow me. Jesus told him, and Levi got up and followed him. So I'm sure that, that that set the stage for some strange discussions among the members of the herd, don't you think? Imagine some of the conversations that probably transpired as they settled down uh, for a nap under the starlit Palestinian skies and they're having a little bit of after-dinner conversation before they all go to sleep and it's four fishermen and one tax collector. Imagine some of the conversation. Imagine some of the emotions. Imagine some of the ideas and philosophies that they might have discussed during that time and talking about the good old days when they felt like they were being cheated by this tax collector. See, Jesus explained... That when the world of their day saw these unlikely companions love Jesus and love one another, it would capture their attention. You get that? The more unlikely we are to be companions, and yet we are drawn together by a common love for Jesus and for other people, the more the world sets up and takes notice. Jesus said this in John 13, 35, By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you do what? If you love one another. If the fishermen could love the tax collector, the world would notice that. And if the tax collector could love the fishermen, the world would notice that. Isn't that incredible? So in this weird herd that we call the Open Door Church, we have a wide variety of people here, don't we? I mean, we've got professional people, up-and-coming people. We've got six-figure income people. You know, we, we got all of that. And then we've got people in our church that are coming out of a really broken situation, made lots of uh, questionable choices in their past that have led them into real poverty and into real dysfunction in life and just really broken, broken, broken. By the way, we're all broken, but some of our brokenness is more visible than others. Get that? And God has put us all together. In this weird herd that we call the Open Door Church. I find that quite incredible. When I scan this crowd, I mean, I look at some of you and I see some of you just well-dressed and very proper and that's all well and fine. I'm happy for you. And then I see some of you that are dressed in just what you've got. I see some of you that um, have no markings on your body at all. And I have some of you that I'm not sure if there's a body under there because I see all the markings that you have. And... I see some of you that have no holes in your body, and I see some of you that have piercings all over your body. I mean, we just got it all, don't we? And that's not a bad thing. That's a good thing. Unlikely companions loving each other gives the world an opportunity to see what the love of Jesus can do. And when they do that, they look at us, and they say one of two things. They either look at the evidence and say, they must really be disciples. Or they look at us and say, it's a cult. You know? I mean, they do. I'm just being honest with you. I hear that all the time. So, so here's the thing. Jesus says that when we really are loving each other the way we're supposed to, as different as we may be, then he says, the world is going to know that you're my disciples. Now, here's another thing. Common mission. Common mission. In, in the Ice Age movie, they were on a common mission. They were going to get that baby back to its daddy. We have a common mission today. As different as we are and, and sharing the love of Jesus, that love constrains us to get engaged in a common mission. That's another amazing thing about this weird herd that Jesus called his church. It is that in spite of all of our individual differences, he has given us a common mission. This is what he said to his church right before he left. This is the, the final scene before Jesus finally went back up to heaven. After living here for about 33 and a half years and all this brokenness and all this sin all around him, Jesus waded through all that never sin and then got ready to leave and he went back to heaven and in that final scene just before he went back to heaven this is what he said he said to his church go and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and of the son and of the holy spirit and teaching them to obey everything i have commanded you and surely 
I am with you always to the very end of the age. And that, my friends, is still the common mission of the herd today. The mission is really quite simple. Go make disciples. That is the mission of the church. And so we don't need to get uh, distracted and we don't need to get weighed down and we don't need to get our focus off on a lot of other things. The mission is go and make disciples. That's always been the mission. That's still the mission. That's going to be the mission until Jesus comes back again. And so what we do among the elders of the Open Door Church is we look at any situation and we say, if we can make disciples by doing this, we'll do it. If we can't make disciples by doing this, there's no point in us doing this. If it doesn't contribute to making disciples, we just don't need to do it. Maybe the Lions Club needs to do it. Maybe the Rotary Club needs to do it. Maybe the Women's Club needs to do it. But the church is supposed to be about the common mission of making disciples. Do you get that? Making disciples. Now, when we stop and consider that, after articulating that mission, Jesus then gave a two-step process for his disciples to use to accomplish the mission. I just love Jesus because he knows us. He knows we're weird and he knows we're not very smart. So he didn't give us a real complicated process to make disciples. He made it pretty simple. You know, once you, once you get somebody to the point that they actually believe in Jesus, because, you know, a disciple is a follower. You're not going to follow someone you don't believe in. So, so first, we've got to help them believe in Jesus. We've got to tell the Jesus story. That's evangelism. That precedes discipleship. It's part of the process. But once you get them to the point where they believe in Jesus, then it's a simple two-step process. And that's what he tells them next in that same section of Scripture. There at the end of Matthew's Gospel. The, the, the first step. The first step, step number one, is what he articulated when he said, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. So once they become a believer, what is step number one in the disciple-making process? Baptize them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's what he said to do next. That's step number one in the, in, in the disciple-making process. And so earlier when, when, uh, uh, when Derek explained that Caleb had believed in Jesus before the service started today and received the gift of eternal life, then when I talked to him, I said, now do you know the next thing that you're supposed to do? And he said, yeah, I want to be baptized next Sunday. You get that? That's the next step in discipleship. That's step number one. Okay? And then he tells us what step number two is. Step number two in discipleship, is teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. It's teaching people to obey Jesus, to obey whatever he commanded. So, so members of the herd must teach newer members of the herd to obey the commands of Christ. That's discipleship. And in order to do so, and I want you to get this, in order to do so, we must identify those commands so we can teach others to obey them. you got to get in the book you gotta, you got to get very familiar with Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and the first few chapters of the book of Acts, because that's the story about the life of Jesus, and that's where you find what he commanded us to do. So if we're going to teach people to obey everything that Jesus commanded, we got to get in there, and we got to find out what those commands are, because you can't teach something you don't know. You can't give it away if you ain't got it. And so we got to do that. It's imperative that we do that. And so in the near future, just in the next few weeks, I'm going to teach some lessons to identify many of those commands of Christ, some of those major commands of Christ that are given to us in the four Gospels and the early um, opening scenes of the book of Acts when Jesus was still here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just point out to you about 49 commands that Jesus gave because you can't teach somebody to obey those commands if you don't know what those commands are. And that's what we're called to do. We are called to make disciples by baptizing them and then teaching them to obey the commands of Christ. So that's what we're going to be doing. We're just going to look at those. We can't spend a lot of time on each one of those, but we're going to look at those and see what those commands are. And I want to say this, and then I want to move on. Our job is not to make people Methodist or Baptist or Presbyterians or Pentecostals or non-denominationalists or anything like that. What is our job? Our job is to make disciples. 
Our job is to teach people to just obey the commands of Christ. All that other stuff is fringe, fluff stuff, and most of it is stuff that men have made up by a misinterpretation of the Word of God. And so we got to do that. Just keep it simple. Jesus said, I know you're not very smart. I'm going to give you two steps. Baptize them, teach them to obey what I commanded. Now, once we, once we get past that and once we understand that, then not only are we an unlikely bunch of companions on a common mission, but another thing, and I love that line in the video clip where, where the character says, Manny says, heard, you look out for each other. You see, we've got to look out for each other. We just got to look out for each other. The Holy Spirit inspired the ancient Apostle Paul to explain that same herd philosophy that should exist in this weird herd that Jesus called his church. He explained it when he wrote this to the believers of, uh, in the herd at Corinth. In 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 25 and 26, he wrote, The members should have the same care for one another. And if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. All the members of the herd should have what? The same care for one another. That means that we look out for each other. That means if I see you going off in a direction that I know is going to be detrimental to you, and if I really love you the way I'm supposed to, I'll call you out on that. You get that? Now, I understand people don't like to be called out, do they? And I understand that there are a significant number of people who don't like me because I do call people out when I see them headed down a direction that I know is going to be destructive to their lives. They don't like it. They leave mad. I get hate mail. I got one this week that is a doozy. I wouldn't even show it to you because it's got too many bad words in it. Uh, D.A. saw it and it embarrassed him, if you can imagine that. Um, so, you got to get that. You got to understand that people won't like you if you love them. If you love them with authentic love. Because sometimes authentic love is a little painful. How many of you have been ever been loved till it hurt? How many of you are grateful that you were loved till it hurt? Yeah. And see, that's the way it is. And so we've got to get hold of that. We've got to look out each, after out each other. We've got to love each other with, with so much love that we have this, this equal care for everybody that's in the herd. And the reason for that is when we love each other and when we got each other's back in the herd, it's good for the whole herd. If I let you suffer in the herd and don't do anything about it, if I don't care enough to help you when you're in trouble, then the whole herd suffers. Isn't that what he said there? If one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. Or if one member is honored, all the members rejoice with it. Now Jesus painted a beautiful, beautiful word picture of what this herd philosophy should look like when he said this. This is in Matthew chapter 25, verses 35 to 36. And in fact, these are some of the key verses that we operate Matthew 25 house under. Jesus said, now here's care. Here, here's, I've got your back. Here's, I'm looking out for you. He said, I was hungry, and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty, and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me in. I needed clothes, and you clothed me. I was sick, and here it is, you looked after me. I was in prison, and you came to visit me. You see, I think Jesus would agree with Manny, the mammoth, who said, that's what you do in a herd. You look out for each other. Do you realize that the stuff that is listed there are many of the things that we try to do here at the Open Door Church? That's why we give away food. Because if you're hungry, what are we supposed to do? Feed you. If you are naked, what are we supposed to do? Clothe you. If you're a stranger, what are we supposed to do? Invite you in. I don't want anybody that comes to the Open Door Church leave feeling like they're a stranger. That's why we take about 10 or 15 minutes and give everybody the opportunity to get at least to some superficial degree acquainted with anybody new that comes in here. You get that? I call it work in the crowd. 
It is to work the crowd. It is to make sure that nobody leaves here without at least, uh, at least five or six or maybe seven people touching their hand and saying, I'm so glad that you're here today. Please come back again. That's why we do that. It's all about nobody leaving, feeling like they're a stranger. And so, you know, we can go on and on here, but that's what the herd is supposed to look like. Like Manny said, that's what you do when you're in a herd. You look out for each other. Here's the conclusion. I'm convinced. I'm convinced that if this weird herd that Jesus calls his church would consistently do what Jesus complimented his first century church for doing, like feeding the hungry, giving water to the thirsty, inviting the stranger in, clothing the naked, caring for the sick, and visiting the incarcerated, then we would be blessed just like the first century church was blessed. They did what he said to do, and what was his response? He blessed them. When we do what we're supposed to do, instead of getting caught up in a bunch of other stuff that's non-essential and non-eternal, then we too can be blessed in that fashion. Let's look at one final example of what the herd should look like. I love this one. Luke wrote this. Now this raises the bar. This really raises the bar about what a herd ought to look like. It's described in Acts chapter 2, verses 44 to 47. Luke described that herd at Jerusalem in the first century. He said, all the believers met together in one place and shared everything they had. Wow. Think about that. A drought had come. People were starving. And guess what the herd did? The people who had in the herd gave to the people who had not in the herd. Oh, isn't that refreshing? They shared everything they had. They sold their property and possessions and shared the money with those in need. Wow! They worshiped together. The haves and the haves nots worshiping together. Do you know that's un almost unheard of in our world today? I challenge you, go to any town in America. Any town in America. And do you know what you'll find if you just do a survey of churches in America? I can take you to any town in, in, in the little tri-state area where we live here. And you know what you'll find in every town? You'll have one church where all the wealthy people go. Isn't that true? And then you'll have another church where the not-so-wealthy people go. And then you'll have another church where the middle-class people go. Am I telling the truth? You can probably name them in your town. And, 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 and you find that to be true. But, but, but look at what happens here. Evidently, you've got haves and have-nots and somewhere in the, in the middle. You've got them all in the same church. And so when the hard times came, then the people who had the ability to do so sold their possessions and gave the money to those who had need. And, and they worshiped together at the temple each day. They met in homes for the Lord's Supper. Amazing. Did you get that? It's okay if you have guests who are Christians over at your house. And, and while you're there having dinner, you break out the unleavened bread and the juice. And you worship the Lord by remembering his body. Because where did these people do it? In their homes. In their homes, they met for the Lord's Supper. Shared their meals with great joy and generosity. All the while praising God and enjoying the goodwill of all the people. And each day, the Lord added to their fellowship those who were being saved. Isn't that incredible? I was just stop and think about this. In the typical American church today, and to some degree, it may be true of our church. You can't be added to that church every day. Because there ain't something going on every day where there's an avenue for you to be added. But what does this say? Every day, people are added to that church. Isn't that incredible? Now, I want you to understand, I want people to be added to this church any time. But... But, but they were added every day. Do you know what that means? That means there had to be clusters of those people meeting every day. 
somewhere in that city, in their homes, eating together, reaching out to non-believers, and then breaking the bread and having the Lord's Supper and talking about what Jesus had done and what that meant to them and how they could have eternal life. All of that had to be happening every day somewhere in that city of Jerusalem because the Lord was adding people to that church. How often? Every day. Every day. How incredible. What a strange herd that must have been. 